G'day there guys, it's your Aussie hubby Marky coming to you live and police monitored from an undisclosed location. Back at it again with another episode of r slash legal advice. Now I know you love these ones so sit down, relax, chuck another prawn on the barbie and get ready for some bloody good content. Our first post today is by user housethief2322, titled Colorado, what do I do with my house? Just like leave the keys on the counter? Like many Americans, I lost my job in 2008 and couldn't afford my mortgage. I had a friend in a similar situation and he just stopped trying and said he'd move out when he got evicted. I didn't feel I had much of a choice, so I did the same thing. I was out of work for 15 months and never made a single payment during that time. During this time I got several notices of late payment, notices of pending eviction, and then… nothing. It never happened. 12 years later, I'm still here, and I haven't made a single mortgage payment. As you can imagine, during this time, I also fell behind on my property taxes. Eventually, I was able to pay off the delinquent taxes, and I've continued to pay them on time every year since. To be honest, I'm not even sure who owns my house anymore. No one has even mailed me anything about it. I looked it up on the county records, and I'm still listed as the owner. Now to my question. Frankly, the house is too big for me now, and I'd like to downsize. My kids have moved out, and my wife passed in 2016. I just don't need this house. The county thinks I own it. How do I tell them I don't, and I've just been living here rent-free? Ironically, I'm worried if I leave, no one will pay the property taxes, and then I'll have a new problem to deal with. Thanks. If the county thinks you own it, then you likely do. Adding on here that OP may have the same mistaken impression a lot of people do. Having a mortgage does not mean the bank owns your home. The bank has a claim on the home if the borrower fails to pay, but they have to go to court and foreclose on the loan to gain ownership of the property, which, as you say, would be recorded. What housing could you procure that would be less than your property taxes? Leaving is problematic, you're still the owner of the house and will be responsible for what happens there code violations, taxes, etc. Any chance it's worth more than the odd lien at this point? Call a title company local to you and see if they are able to identify any liens and get you a payoff. Don't give them any information about the old loan. See what they can find on their own. I don't think I could find any house cheaper than what I'm paying now. It's true. It's just the house is too big for me and getting harder for me to maintain. Plus, now that my kids are gone, it's pretty lonely here. I'm not sure what this house is worth. I bought it for 250000 and had the mortgage down to about 200000 before I stopped paying, and I haven't paid anything since. A house in the neighborhood sold for about $450,000 a few months ago, and two more are for sale at 475000 and 525000 though mine is smaller and not as nice. Like I said, it's becoming hard to maintain, but I have been keeping up. I put a new roof on six years ago, and redid the kitchen and the master bath to modernize it. Not the HGTV special though, no barn doors here. It's probably worth a decent amount, but like I said, I haven't paid a dime on the mortgage in years. I like your idea of calling a title company, and seeing if they can find out for me. Thanks. Definitely talk to a real estate attorney. Depending on your loan, the interest accrual, and what state your house is in, you could possibly have a home with a good chunk more than what you owe the bank. Practically, a maid that comes twice a week will still likely be less than new rent, property taxes. Loneliness is a different issue though. Maybe think about renting a bedroom or two. You can take your time and find some good tenants, especially if you charge below market rent, which you can afford to do. This would give you a little bit of a social outlet, plus some extra income. Maybe find someone who can help with yard work, etc., in exchange for reduced rent. The loan agreements are likely gone. Whatever your balance was back at the time of the foreclosure is probably still your balance. It's your house. Whatever you find out from your title company, you're free to call a realtor and sell it. Sounds like you'll pocket a quarter million on top of having a free place to live for a dozen years. Nice transaction. Compound interest on a 15-year-old loan will be significant, so I'd suggest the balance could be a lot more than 200000 However, perhaps the act of foreclosure effectively cancels the loan. Before leaving your home, be sure to get your finances together. 
If you've had trouble just paying the property taxes over the last few years, let alone with a mortgage, then I think I can safely conclude that you've had some money problems. Hopefully things are better for you now. If not, you might want to think twice about leaving. Any place you move will have rent or mortgage payments unless you get enough money from the sale of this house to buy another entirely in cash. Make sure you account for all the costs of the new place so you don't end up over your head financially. Let's take a different look. You purchase the house, your name is on the deed. You signed the loan. 12 years ago, when everything went downhill, you stopped paying the mortgage. But you have paid the property taxes. The bank filed a lien and default, but stopped at that point for some reason. Finally, you have a $200,000 lien on a $450,000 property. Some are recommending a real estate attorney. I think you need a consumer debt attorney. In order to take the property from you, the bank is going to have to take you back to court. At that point, you can demand they prove you owe the debt, they have to produce the actual loan documents or proper copies of the documents that have your signature. Statements, your cancelled checks, none of that actually shows proof, if you are contesting in court. There is a very real chance the paperwork is gone and they have no ability to prove the actual debt. In that case, you can discharge the lien and sell the house for $450,000, pay your attorney, and keep the cash. This is the best case scenario, and you need an attorney that specializes in debt and foreclosures. And after the mess in 2008, there are a lot of them. So, what's the worst case scenario? You walk out of the house, vagrants take over, burn it, and the fire takes out all three of your neighbors and you're on the hook for one and a half million. You need an attorney to guide you. It could be you own the place outright, or you own more than it is worth. Only an attorney can really get to the bottom of this, and they can negotiate with the bank. You might be able to get out of this with some real money to buy something smaller somewhere else. They could also get you out with a shirt on your back, but no debt or liability hanging over you, and you can walk into something else. Don't be afraid of your situation. Face it head on, get some help, and deal with it. It will help you financially and mentally. Good luck. I guess personally, I agree with all this advice given, considering the fact that I'm young and I don't know half the stuff that's being talked about here. I don't have any practical or good advice for OP, but hey, you know, let's hope that no bums uh, can break into his house and burn the whole lot down. It doesn't sound too practical. It kind of sounds like half the entitled parent stories that I read out, but that's my marky two cents. You're free to fight me on that down in the comments if you'd like. Anyway, let's move on to the update. Colorado. What do I do with my house? Just leave the keys on the counter? I want to thank everyone for the advice on my last post and to give a brief update. I spoke to an attorney about it and she started looking into it. First thing she said is that I am still the owner and that the eviction process was never completed. She also told me that there's still a lien on the house, which is where it gets interesting. My mortgage was ultimately sold to a second mortgage company, which no longer exists. The second mortgage company that had my mortgage was absorbed by a third company, which went bankrupt and collapsed. Because I've been maintaining the property and paying property taxes, coupled with no lien holder asserting their rights, she believes she can get the lien holder removed from the title. So as it turns out, I may end up owning my home free and clear after all. Unfortunately, she doesn't know how long everything will take, so I don't anticipate an update for a while. But thank you all. And that one was posted two days ago. I obviously could go and message him and ask, but I think that's, uh, that's where we're at for now. If there is an update, I'll be sure to cover everything again in the future, give us a better idea of what's going on. But these things take months, weeks, years. Who knows when the next update's going to come. Posted by user Dillamidge, titled... Can my parents force me to change my religion? I'm 15 and in Michigan State. My parents have recently converted to Islam and want me to convert as well. We were Buddhists before. I have no interest in changing my religion. They tell me that I have no choice because I'm a minor child. They want me to repeat a sentence after them, which proclaims me as part of their religion and start living by its rules. I don't like the rules because they're too restrictive. Can my parents legally force me to repeat those words? Can they punish me if I don't? 
They have told me that for every week that I don't, they will take my things away from me, and after 10 weeks they will physically force me to say the words, and even if I resist, that I will be sent to an all-Muslim boarding school somewhere far away. I'm tired of this game, and just want to live my life like a normal person. Edit. Thank you. I'm going to let them punish me and cross the line into abuse, then contact police and CPS to place me into foster care. What the hell? Physically forcing you to say the words, sending you to a boarding school out of the country, or taking away certain things like food, may cross the line into child abuse and you should contact a guidance counsellor, child protective services, etc. Making you eat halal, taking away your Xbox because you won't be going to the mosque, and such would not though. So specifics of what they're doing and punishments matters. This is what they say which will be taken away. Week 1, all electronics. 2, all my clothes except one robe. 3, all my books except school. 4, all my school books. 5, my room's door. 6, my bed, blanket, pillows. 7, every single item removable in my room. 8. Light and heating. 9. All food and drinks except bread and water. 10. I'll be sent to boarding school. Have they put this in writing? At some point you can call CPS. If you're in public school, you can ask the guidance counsellor about where the line would be in terms of unpleasant parents versus abusive parents. Yes, it's on the fridge. Get a photo with your cell phone. Send a copy to a friend who is not in the community for safekeeping. Thank you, it's done. Weeks 4, 6, 8, and 9 are all very problematic. You should contact CPS, although be aware it may mean ending up in the foster system. I prefer the foster system. Okay, so if I let them do those things to me then contact CPS, is there a chance they'll get me out of here? CPS will generally try to work with your parents to correct their behaviour first, and resort to removing you from their care if you're in immediate danger, or if your parents are unrepentant and persistent about depriving you of basic necessities. It's not anywhere near as simple as call CPS, end up in foster care. But if your parents, for example, deny you a bed, or refuse to feed you, then CPS can absolutely intervene to protect you. What if they beat me up? Well, that is an imminent threat to your life, and you can call the police and or CPS. If you have physical bruising on you, it violates corporal punishment laws in every state in America and counts as child abuse. Realistically, they can't force you to say anything. Practically, they can make your life very difficult if you don't. Based on the fact that they're your parents and have pretty broad authority over punishing you for not following their rules, so long as their views don't grossly violate the law. They can't force you to believe, but they can force you to go to religious services, for instance, and can enforce whatever rules the religion prescribes. Here's what you're going to do. You're going to get a note or a copy of it. You're going to report all the crazy crap your parents have threatened to your school counsellors at once, including the story of a girl being smuggled to Mexico and then Saudi Arabia and you're going to tell them you fear for your life if you return to your parents. Make it very clear you feel if you return that you will be kidnapped and killed. At your age, they will likely support you being kept somewhere safe. And you know what, I think that's very good advice. Uh, obviously, that last one seems like a huge overreaction, but hey, if you're getting that vibe from your parents, and you know them as the kid, and you know that's something that they would do, why wouldn't you take every step to protect yourself and save your own ass in this situation? I feel like that edit that OP gave us, that was really, that's, you know, that's a very heads up play. It seems extreme in a lot of circumstances, I understand that, but if you felt your life was being under threat because you're being forced to do these things and you don't want to, and they're going to deprive you of all your basic human rights, why wouldn't you? Why wouldn't you do what they're doing? Anyway, let's move on to the update. Posting an update, I am finally in foster care and away from parents and community. I'm happy I never said the words and never converted, but my life has been hell in the last nine months. My parents did all the things that they said they'd do to me, and a lot more. It became even more violent, which my mum always denied, and said they're self-inflicted. After several CPS visits, I am now taken away from them, and my father is being charged with domestic violence, and I think my mum is also facing charges. I've been in foster care for a few weeks, and it's nice to be honest. 
Other kids in this home are also nice, and at least everything is normal and I feel safe here. I hope I don't have to go back. Posted by user Pass the Butter, titled Massachusetts. Hospital placed a wire in my arm to track me without my knowledge or consent. Photo included for proof. I have called multiple law offices, but no one is returning my calls. Somebody please, please help me. About three weeks ago, I was admitted to a psychiatric hospital due to various problems. It's a long story, but the short version is I have a psychoaffective personality disorder and I was not taking my meds properly. After I was stabilized, I was discharged, but it has come to my attention that something is terribly wrong. The hospital has placed a wire in my arm that I believe acts as a tracking device. It is quite obvious, especially when I flex my arm. I can see it bulge in my wrist. I've tried to take a picture, but Imga is not letting me upload. This has caused me great distress. I stay locked in my house because I'm afraid of going somewhere or doing something quote unquote wrong and getting forced back to the hospital. I've also become concerned about my medications. If the hospital staff inserted a wire without my consent, what have they done with my meds? I have Zyprexa and Haldol, but I dare not take them now. I have a few questions about the legal aspect of all this. One, the insertion of the tracking device without my consent. Surely that's not legal. My understanding is the patient has to consent before a medical procedure is done. Two, the distress caused by this. Does that count as damages? Should I sue? Three, how on earth do I get the wire removed? I don't have money to pay a surgeon to remove it. Can I get the psych hospital to pay for it? I called several law offices in my area and explained my case, but no one has called me back. I feel so violated, and I'm getting desperate. Please, somebody help me. Hi OP, I'm a mental health lawyer. It must be very distressing to you to believe that you are being tracked. Importantly, it is very insightful of you to recognize and acknowledge your mental illness. Do you have a mental health team that you are working with in the community that can help check in with you about your concerns? Alternatively, do you have a GP who you can check in with to speak about your concerns? Hello, I have a psychiatrist, a counsellor, and a case manager. It being the weekend, I'm not sure they are available. The agency they work for does have a 24-hour crisis line, but I'm not sure who is on the other end of the phone. I have a GP, but I have not seen her in a while. She basically just prescribes my blood pressure medication. In any case, I've been talked into calling an ambulance, so I guess I'm going to the ER. That's probably best because I can't leave my house to get groceries, and I haven't eaten in a long time. I'm really proud of you, OP. I can only imagine that this is very scary for you. The ambulance option is perfect, though, because they will be able to help you get directly from point A to point B. Once you get to the hospital, the doctors there can hopefully sort out your concerns about your arm, and adjust your medications to help you feel better, not to mention get some food in you. Let me know how it goes, okay? After you're seen at the ER, you can call your psychiatrist's office for a follow-up appointment. Make sure to mention that you have been seen in the ER recently, that they have been able to get you in quicker. The ER will be able to help you with immediate issues, and the follow-up with your psychiatrist will be able to find a long-term plan. This is a perfect example of client-centered support, pure validation with the goal of guiding folks in the right and safest direction. It starts with a healthy dose of empathy, that's something a lot of medical care can easily miss. Compassion fatigue is a serious problem that administrators and supervisors are rarely trained to address in their subordinates. Hi, electronics engineer here, and I am not a lawyer. I don't think the technology exists to make a tracking device in the form of a thin wire. This literally only exists in sci-fi. To do tracking, you need some sort of way to receive an external signal, such as GPS. A GPS antenna capable of receiving the extremely low power signals from the satellite versus just receiving noise would definitely not fit in a wire. A battery or energy source to power said tracking device would also not fit in a wire. First of all, thank you for taking the time to share your situation with us. I am sorry that you are suffering. I would like to share some advice so that you may have some relief. Is that okay? Not a lawyer, but I've worked in the mental health field. I would like to share my thoughts about your situation, is that okay? I feel that a trip to the emergency department would be the quickest way to resolve this situation. 
a physician can assess your arm and determine the best course of action. They can also adjust your meds, and you will feel much better when they do. If you're afraid to leave your house and drive to an ER, call an ambulance. That's what they are for. They will take care of you. I'd like to share something with you. I feel that you are a good person. I feel that you want the best for yourself, and that you will take the best course of action. I have outlined one such course above. Please seek medical help, OP, and thank you for following my advice. Thank you so much for your kind words. It is nice to hear. My concern is that the ambulance crew will take me back to the same psych hospital that installed the wire. Thank you for sharing your concerns with me. I'd like to assure you that the ambulance will take you to the nearest emergency department, not a psych hospital. Okay, how can I call an ambulance? Just call 911 and say I need one? I've never done this before. Yes. Tell them you need a ride to the hospital because you have a foreign object in your arm and you've not eaten anything in several days. This was incredibly well-delivered advice. This thread has been really inspiring that all you folks have done amazingly. I really hope the OP is getting the help he needs now. And OP put an edit in their post that says, Thanks to everyone who has talked to me. I guess legal advice is not really what I needed. I'm calling an ambulance and getting help. And they didn't put an update further to this post, but I don't think that an update further on would be appropriate. The OP seems extremely mentally ill, and their post history reflects that, so I think we have to respect their privacy and say they got the help they need, they got really good advice in this thread, and we can move on to the next post. Posted by user, oh snap -a doodles titled, Bonus Wages Taken Away After Hours Worked. I posted this in Personal Finance, and they suggested I post it here in Legal Advice. I also wasn't sure which flair to choose. I live and work in Nebraska, and I'm curious if this situation is kosher at all, as a lot of my coworkers are upset about it. Over the last few months, my work has offered a shift pickup bonus. If you pick up a shift, you get extra money on top of what you would normally make an hour. Other than saying we get a bonus for shifts picked up, there has been no other communication about it, and everyone who picks up a shift, FT, PT, or PRN employees, have been getting the shift pickup bonus. Until today. One of the higher-ups texted all of the PRN employees, and informed us that we no longer get shift pickup bonuses, because we don't have scheduled days, and work when we can. Definition of PRN. This seemed okay, because sometimes they stop doing the bonus to bring it back later, but then they sent a correction text to tell us that for the previous pay period, no bonuses will be paid out, as it is our new company policy that no one in my facility knew about until today. They are taking these bonuses away after we have already worked the hours and pay period has ended. Until today, all employees worked under the assumption that they would get the shift bonus for any shift picked up and pick up shifts to get the bonus. A lot of my co-workers worked a lot to cover rent and other bills, and now this money is being pulled out from underneath them when they expected to have it. I could understand that this policy went into effect as of today, since no one knew about it, but to take the money away for days worked before today seems cruel and not kosher to me. What does anyone make of this situation? And yes, I have covered this one before, but it came up again, and I want to cover it again. The wording of the original policy is going to matter here. If PRN employees don't have scheduled shifts, then how were they able to pick up a shift? Qualifying for the bonus? Question mark? Unfortunately, I don't have a picture of the notice that was taped up on the door in the break room, but the gist of it said pick up bonus for shifts picked up. It did not specify that it was shifts picked up on top of scheduled shifts. It has always previously worked that any shift picked up would get the bonus. They are informing us today that that is no longer the case but it starts from two weeks ago instead of today. Any shift we scheduled for ourselves, or were asked to work, we got a shift bonus for. The context of what the phrase shift picked up means and the job is going to matter. To me, that sounds like picking up an open shift, i.e. an unfilled 8am to 2pm shift on the calendar. It wouldn't mean showing up for your regularly scheduled shift. If your job doesn't have shifts, then I'm not sure how you would even expect to pick up one in the first place, but that's going to be more arguable. Up until today, shift picked up was any open shift that needed a CNA. PRN employees don't have a regular schedule. They write their name on the schedule where open shifts are and work that shift, and would receive a bonus for every four hours worked. 
so all PRN staff that wrote their name in for a 4 plus hour shift would get the bonus. Up until today, when we were told no more, and by the way, it goes back two weeks to a pay period that ended already. From what you provided, it doesn't sound like PRNs were excluded until the policy changed. Their screw up, not yours. You should ask for the money for previous hours worked. You can file a wage complaint with the DOL if your employer disagrees. Thank you. I don't think they can take away a bonus after you've already worked the shift in question. You agreed to work that shift for a particular wage. They can absolutely end the policy for PRN employees in the future, but you worked those hours in the past expecting to be paid that bonus. Just how far back do they think they can claw that back? Yeah, they can absolutely take it away. They take it away and bring it back a few times throughout the year. They are clawing it back two weeks to an already ended pay period that we are getting paid for this Friday, so the 5th to the 8th I believe. This seems illegal, based on everything I've read on here concerning wages. Basically, they're trying to change your rate of pay after you've worked a shift. And as far as I know, that is illegal. If they think this is legal, what's to stop them from going back an entire year? Contact Nebraska DOL. Thank you. I anticipate filing a wage claim and have told the other PRN staff to do this also. And now, update. Bonus wages taken away after hours worked. Update to this post. Even though my original post only had a few comments, I wanted to post an update because the few people who commented really helped. I filed a wage complaint last week and encouraged my fellow PRN aides to also file a complaint. In total, seven of us filed a complaint with the NDOL. I received an email back from DOL pretty quickly, with them asking for a lot of info and documentation about my side of the story. It was pretty late on Friday, so I didn't hear anything back until today. Before I heard back from NDOL this morning, I got a text from the person who texted all the PRN aides, who was just a messenger for the main admin person, telling me I had a check waiting for me in the office for my bonus money. About 10 minutes after I got that text, I got a call from the person who took on the claims that were filed. She let me know what my company was trying to do was not legal, and that I should have a check waiting for me. She told me seven of us filed a complaint, and she reviewed them all and sent the admin a letter saying they couldn't take those bonuses away from us. PRN staff no longer will receive a bonus as of last week, but that's okay. Overall, this whole process ended well for the PRN aides. Thank you to the commenters who walked me through this and let me know this wasn't legal. We probably would have let this slide if I hadn't asked for help. Edit for location bot, this is Nebraska. Well, I think that's where I'm going to leave today's episode, guys. I really hope you enjoyed this one of r slash legal advice. If you did, make sure to leave it down in the comments. Tell me what you thought about it. Tell me whatever you've been up to today, guys. I know you like the new face. I got the uh, champion shirt. That last story kind of sucked, didn't it? Like, I'm glad that she did get her money back and that they took it to the DOL. That's what you would want to hear. Anyway, guys, if you liked it, do leave a thumbs up. Tell me what you thought. Once again, memberships are open. Patreon's open if you want to support the channel. Do whatever. Subscribe to my second channel. I'm going to be putting up some new content on there soon. And hey, click on any of the links on screen. There's like a sick video or something. I don't know what side it goes on. But yeah, hope you had a good one. I'll see you later. Bye.